Welcome or welcome back to Trail and Ultra Running Training. My name is Will Franz. I'm a trail running coach, personal trainer, strength coach. The whole goal of this podcast is to help you train a little better so we can have more fun out on the trails and do the thing that we really enjoy doing. And if you like this, please share it with somebody or do the things that help spread it farther and have a bigger reach. You know, the kind of things that everybody asks you to do on the internet all the time. Anyway, today I want to give some very practical advice on workouts. And if you hear my voice is kind of scratchy, I am getting just killed by allergies. And because I have asthma, it has been a real pain. So sorry, bear with me. I hope it's not not too bothersome, and I hope I don't sound completely like I am um, being graded apart by a cheese grater. Anyway, three workouts to help you get faster is what I want to go into today. Some very practical ways to modify or work through your training so that we can really do well and get faster and have more fun at those easier paces, right? Because if the harder paces become easier, then the easier paces become easier. There's a bunch of reasons to do speed work. Some of them are health-related. We've seen that a higher VO2 max leads to longer, like longevity you know, for, for health outcomes. All sorts of reasons that we might want to do some high-intensity work. But it also just will help us out on the trail. Yes, if you do a ton of low and slow work, if you're running big weekly mileage, then your VO2 max will elevate anyway. But if we're not running massive mileage and we're spending all of our time in the 30 to 50 miles per week that we're doing in the zone two and lower space, then we're probably not going to get a lot faster because we're just not giving the body the stimulus it needs to show it that it needs to make that adaptation. So with that precursor, let's talk about some workouts. First one, this is more geared towards a like VO2 max or high intensity. There's many things that are happening here. Some of it is a direct VO2 max stimulus, and then some of it is just a like neuromuscular stimulus. What your your body, your brain is talking to your body and talking to your muscles and teaching you to move better and get faster. And these are five, four, five, six, but probably five by three minutes hard and then three minutes off. And you're really looking to push the hard part hard here. So there's a bunch of ways to dictate how difficult. I really like to look at a mile pace or a mile effort. And that's because you don't need to completely murder yourself On these intervals, if we look at running um, as hard as we can, we probably will be losing some form by the end of it, right? We still want to keep good running form, still want to keep good uh, proper muscular engagement, still want to be using our glutes as well as we can and not like over leveraging our um, low back or anything that we're doing to to run better, right? So you don't need to go out so fast or so hard that we see a drop off in speed at the end. We don't need to go out so fast or so hard that everything just kind of blows up and your your quads are on fire. We want to keep a pretty consistent pace throughout the interval. And it's going to feel harder as you go on because that's how it works. And if you want an idea of how this like what this feels like, then we would go out like the week before we start these intervals, and go test your mile pace. Try to race a mile, which probably sounds a little freaky unless you're like used to running a bunch of 5Ks. I hadn't run a like hard mile in a very long time prior to to doing this, and was a little intimidated going out, a little shaky in the warm-up, warmed up for like 10 to 15 minutes, tossed in some surges, which we'll get back to what that means later, and... And then I went for it, and it predictably sucked, but it was fine, and I didn't die, and I had a good run, and then I like did a longer, easy run at the end of it to kind of cool down, and I had a good idea of what, either if I'm doing it on flat ground, a VO2 max pace or effort might feel like, and it gave me a good target. Because if we are running a hard mile, 
then we are going to be in that VO2 max space. It is going to be one of the larger limiters for that. Another one would be leg strength and form things, running economy. But VO2 max will be a limiter if you're trying to push your mile. So if we go do that, then we know we're getting into that stimulus range. We know we're cranking the heart rate, but we're not necessarily pushing it as hard as we as hard as we can for the three minutes, right? So let's say I run a mile in seven minutes and it, if I'm going to do three minutes that it sucks by three minutes, it doesn't feel good, but I could certainly go further. And as we do that, we should figure out what it, what it feels like. Pay attention to the effort, pay attention to what it feels like three minutes in, figure out like, cause pace might not be your best metric unless you're in the flatlands, unless you're like training for the Chicago marathon, unless you have a like really flat city and running trail, then pace might not always be constant, right? If we want to do these, we might do them uphill. And I actually really like to do these uphill, but I'm clearly not going to run up an incline as fast as I'm going to run on flat ground. So the pace will drop, but the effort should feel similar. Right? So having an idea of whatever that is, is a good idea. So go out, test a hard mile, see what that feels like. If you can do it in the same terrain that you want to do these intervals for a few weeks, then great. You'll have a really good idea of your pace. And then when we're doing this workout, you're going to warm up for 10 to 15 minutes, toss in some surges, which are just like 10 to 15 seconds of faster speed, and then push at that effort at that difficulty at that pace for three minutes and then walk for three minutes you can if you're if you're really fit and walking just feels like a waste of time we can do like a really slow trot back to the front or through it but walking is absolutely fine you want to be able to give everything you can to those three minutes so there's no there's no harm in walking there's no harm in resting you could even sit down if you want to, but personally, I like to stay moving because if I push really hard for three minutes and then sit down, my legs feel bad and I'll actually perform worse. So I highly re- recommend staying moving, but it doesn't need to be hard. You can just mosey, trot, really easy jog, whatever feels good for you. So five by three minutes hard, be it uphill or at like a flat mile pace is a really good workout that's going to improve your like upper end of cardio and going to improve a lot of that neuromuscular connection. Another one that's going to hit a different realm of your cardio is going to be lactate intervals. So this is probably going to be three, four rounds, maybe two, but probably three or four rounds of like 10 to 20 minutes at a, for most people, it's going to be a 10K pace, right? A lactate threshold is about an hour. For some people, it might be a little closer to 45 minutes if we're not, if we haven't done a ton of training. For really elite athletes, it might be 70, 75, but right about an hour is going to be your lactate threshold. And if we, most of us, if we run a 10K, it's going to be somewhere in that 45 to 60 minute range. So that'll give us a good clue of where this like lactate threshold pace is, right? Um, You might sometimes see this marked as half marathon pace. And that's because professional runners run a half marathon in about an hour. But for most of us, that is way too slow to really stimulate that lactate threshold. So we're looking for about an hour pace, about a 10K pace, and this is how I have people test to see what this might feel like. We're gonna do warm up again, 10 to 15 minutes, some easy surges, and then go basically race a 10K. Run for an hour as hard as you think you can, so like you're pretty toasted by the end of that hour, but you're not you're not seeing a big, de- big degradation in pace, right? And if we figure out what that feels like, it's probably not going to be super comfortable 10 to 20 minutes in, but you have a lot left in the tank. And that's what we're looking for for these intervals. So where we're getting into the space where we're stimulating a lot of lactate production. Lactate is a fuel. It has been demonized forever as lactic acid, which is different and um, not really produced by the body unless we're in some problems. The thing that makes your muscles hurt is hydrogen ions that are a side effect of lactate. But lactate itself is great. It's a preferred fuel for the brain. It's a preferred fuel for the heart. And if we produce a bunch of it and teach our body to use it well, then we will get a lot faster. So pushing for, like, I start people, at once we do our 10K test and figure out what that feels like, then we'll do three by 10-minute intervals, with a like two to five minute rest. 
if you want to be really cautious, you can always go with um, like half rest interval to um, effort. So if you do 10 minutes on, you might do five minutes off. If you were doing 15 minutes on, you do seven and a half minutes off. Perfectly fine. They've also done some studies and they show that for a lot of people, somewhere in that two to five minute range is plenty for this type of interval. So do you play with it? I tend to set five minutes for people and just make sure they feel recovered. Right? So I will start people at like three by 10, then we might move to three by 12, to four by 10, to three by 15, something like that might look like a reasonable progression for a month or five weeks or whatever of lactate intervals. And just play with it. Go out, run at an hour pace, put about five minute, two to five minutes of space between your intervals. Again, you can walk these, you can jog them, but treat them as recovery. We need to actually recover if we're going to give everything we can to these intervals. And then so easy cool down, done. And then the third one I really like is a natural fartlek. And fartlek means speed play. I believe it's Swedish. And it is especially good, I think, for trail runners and especially good for those who like live in areas with some like rolling hills. And you just go play with the terrain and push it on the uphill, cruise the downs is one of my favorite ways to do this. So if you have a bunch of rolling terrain, every uphill, push it really hard and then cruise the downs. So you're not walking, you're just coasting, right? Floating. Any of these words that we use to indicate that you're still, you're still running, but you're running at a pace where we might be in zone two or that like low zone three, right? And I really like a natural fartlek for a few reasons. One, they tend to be fun because it just lets you run to however your body's feeling and it allows you to like enjoy the run, get out of your head a little bit. You might not even pay much attention to your watch. I will often put my like hit record on my watch for these runs and then just put it to the time face so that I know like where I am or like occasionally check in how far I've gone. But for the most part, just cruise and go enjoy a trail, right? And if we do these, one of the, the benefits we're really getting here is we are also creating some lactate production because if we naturally run and naturally push uphill, we're probably going to be in that kind of zone zone three, upper zone three, low zone four space where we are producing a bunch of lactate. It's going to be, again, kind of that 10K effort zone. And then by like cruising the downs, we teach our body to recover while running, right? You learn this recovery pace, recovery effort while still moving at a decent clip. So your body gets better at actually using that lactate and using it as a fuel that it is. So these are three workouts I program quite a bit for people and I do them in that order, kind of in a training season, right? So depending how long we have before race, I would love to start with some of those VO2 max intervals. If we're on kind of a tight time crunch, they might be less relevant unless the person just has like zero top end. And then we move into some lactate stuff. And then we move into more kind of like fart lucky stuff as we are increasing running volume. And that helps for a few reasons. One, VO2 work is just not particularly directly relevant to a trail. So we do it far as far away as possible. And then the like fartlek style stuff, while being effective speed work, isn't um, quite as stressful on, on the body. So if we're pushing some of those back-to-back -back weekend runs or longer runs in general, this gives a little less stimulus or intensity while we're midweek trying to still get some speed work in but not not breaking ourselves down, right? Like trying to maintain some of that longevity. Now, if you are really new, don't worry about this. Focus on building mileage first. Like any of these workouts are going to take 45, 60, 75 minutes if you're doing the 3 by 15 lactate intervals. And if you're only running a couple total hours per week, then 
that's over half of your running volume in a single intense workout. That doesn't make sense, right? We want to build that base first. This is why on 50K plan I have, I say, like, this is not really a beginner plan because there is speed work in it. It is designed to be done once you were already up at that like 20 to 30 base volume, because that allows enough room for us to get some of these workouts moving, right? So build that base volume to 20, 30 miles per week to where we're running multiple hours per week, not at the same time, but like spread out throughout the week. And before we start to install a bunch of speed work and intense work into our running, we really need to have that solid base, now, for everyone, though, I do think strides, surges, and hill repeats are really relevant. And these are not typically considered speed work, although they have a lot of speed carryover. Like, they will help you get faster. They will help your running form get better. They will help you, like, get used to moving at that quicker pace and your brain talking to your muscles better. So if we're looking at strides, surges, or hill repeats, they all follow the basic same structure of a few. We're talking like three to five to six, maybe. Um, sometimes you'll do more, but for most people, I program somewhere in the in like four to six range. And we're looking for 10 to 15 seconds. And it's a gradual, quick acceleration. So you're not like trotting up, but you're also not like starting off the blocks, right? Like it's not a down multi-point start driving as quickly as you can out the front. This is a gradual but quick acceleration to like 95% of top speed. You don't necessarily want to be going so fast that we lose any kind of form because we are, one of the benefits here is that it does improve your form. So if we're trying to, trying to drill good form, then we don't want things to fall apart, right? Like not extending into your low back, failing to use your glutes, um, any of these things. So fast enough that it's really close to your top speed, but not so much that the wheels are falling off. Four to six by 10 to 15 seconds. Now, stride surges and hill repeats are different, but same theme. So strides would be this at the end of a run. You'd go do however far you're supposed to run, two, three miles, whatever. And then you will do a stride where you gradually pick up, um, hold, hold that top speed for 10 to 15 seconds, and then gradually under control, slow down, right? And then you'd probably walk back to the start or just keep walking down the block, completely re recover as much as you can, probably every 60 seconds or so, 90 seconds, and repeat. A surge is that, but interspersed in a run. So same idea, you're doing your two, three, whatever, four miles of a run. You gradually pick up speed, hold that for 10 to 15 seconds, gradually come down, and then just continue your easy run. So a surge and a stride are basically the same. A surge is in the middle of a run. A stride is like dedicated at the end. And a hill repeat, same structure, up a hill. Run up the hill really hard, walk back down the hill, rest if you need to, run up the hill really hard, walk back down the hill. And this hill doesn't need to be like some 45 degree incline. It, depending on what your race looked like, we might want a little steeper, but we're probably looking like 10, 10%. 10% is a good thing for, for hill repeats if we just want to throw a number at it. And anywhere from like 5 to 20 is probably relevant, but if you have some kind of like 10 to 15% hill, that is really good for these like concentrated hill repeats. Now, if you're doing these things on a treadmill, um, all of the earlier workouts, pretty easy to move. You just move the speed up and down. For strides or hill repeats, they can be harder. So the way I would run a stride on the treadmill is actually set the pace like pretty fast and run for that 10 to 15 seconds. And then I would actually like pop my feet off at the end, which I realize loses the gradual deceleration. But if you just pump the speed down, it might not slow you down fast enough. So play with it see what works for you. I actually really like to do strides on those like self-powered, be it assault or true form or woodway or whatever treadmills because they allow you to control speed a lot better. And then for hill repeats, same kind of thing, like set the incline um, at whatever incline you're going to do these, and then don't, don't change the incline, just change the speed or step off the treadmill. 
because it takes so long for that thing to climb up that by the time you you get up and down, you're just going to be wasting a lot of this like time. So I hope that was really, I hope that was helpful. Um, three like solid workouts you can use to get faster and then a thing that is not necessarily a workout, but will also really help you get faster. So thanks for sticking around, listening to me talking about running. If you like it, again, please share it. I'd appreciate it. And I'll be back soon with another one. I hope you go have some great fun on the trails. Thank you again for listening to the Trail and Ultra Running Training Podcast. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Just a reminder, nothing you hear on this podcast is medical advice, and you should always speak with a medical professional before making changes to your training or your nutrition. If you enjoyed the podcast or found it helpful, please leave a rating or review. It tells the algorithm robots that people like it, and that means more people will hear it. Or even better, just share it with someone who you think would benefit. If you prefer a video version, head to the Trail and Ultra Running Training Group on Facebook, or check out the Mountain Goat Endurance Coaching YouTube channel. Thank you again, and I hope you have a great next run.